For thousands of years, dozens and dozens of Native American tribes lived and migrated through the lands of the Western Great Lakes and the Upper Mississippi Valley. In the late 1600s, French explorers and missionaries contacted a wide variety of Native peoples. For over a hundred years, both the Indians and the French mutually benefited from the fur trade. The Indians were easily able to procure valuable beaver pelts for the traders, and in return gained access to previously unattainable materials, such as iron tools and utensils, woven clothes and blankets, and firearms, which proved to be of much use against native enemies still relying on stone arrows and spears. It was the French who established trade routes and portages along the upper Midwest's rivers and lakes, connecting the rest of the world to the frontier. Yet, when the world heard of the riches of the North American hinterland, they weren't going to let France keep all the wealth for herself. Britain and her colonies to the east fought a series of wars in the early and mid-1700s to arrest control of the land and waterways of the fur country from the French. Most of the natives sided with France. The French had the best connections and weren't attempting to snatch and settle large areas of territory like the British Americans. Many Indians from Wisconsin and Michigan took part in early French victories of the war, often acting as the deciding factor in battle. Yet, lack of resources and support from the French government meant that defeat and conquest was only a matter of time. The Great Lakes would become part of the British Empire for a short time before being handed off to the new United States under the name the Northwest Territory. It was in this territory, at the confluence of the Rock and Mississippi Rivers around the year 1667, that the Sauk warrior Black Hawk was born. He claimed to be descended from the first Sac chief, Thunder, and took part in his first combat at the age of 15 in a raid against the Osage tribe. During the next 20 years, Black Hawk would continue to fight in his tribe's wars against the Chippewa, Osage, Kaskaskias, and the Cherokee. It was in a fight with the latter that Black Hawk's father was killed. Now Black Hawk inherited the tribe's medicine bag and became a war chief. During these intense years of warfare, Black Hawk had not been able to visit St. Louis and see, as he put it, his Spanish father, the governor of Upper Louisiana. When he finally could make the trip, he heard surprising news. The United States had purchased the Louisiana Territory. Now not only was Black Hawk's home village Saucanoc on the Sauk land in Illinois under U.S. control, but all the Sac land west of the Mississippi River as well. In the first few years after the American Revolution, Sac land wasn't an interest to the U.S. government or American settlers. But now the government wanted to open land for future development. In 1804, William Henry Harrison, governor of the Indiana Territory, the District of Louisiana, and superintendent of Indian Affairs, saw an opportunity for a land treaty when four Sac men came to St. Louis to procure the release of one of their countrymen, who had murdered an American. The Sac representatives were turned into a treaty delegation. Apparently quite drunk, they agreed to turn over all Sac land east of the Mississippi, and return for a tribal annuity. Tragically, the sack man they had come to release was shot dead while trying to escape, or killed in cold blood, depending on who you ask. Black Hawk would never realize the legitimacy of the St. Louis Treaty of 1804. This and subsequent events would lead the Sac and many other tribes in the region to look for an ally against the Americans. While the United States was expanding in population and territory, the nation and its government was suffering from growing pains. President Jefferson sent out several expeditions to learn about the new land and the people he was responsible for. First, the Lewis and Clark expedition followed the Missouri River and then headed west. Zebulon Pike was sent north of the Mississippi. Pike was instructed to make contact and treaties with all the native peoples he encountered. He was also to take British peace medals and flags from the chiefs, telling them that a new father, now in Washington, was there for them. However, not having any medals or flags to replace the ones he took was a serious diplomatic blunder, as Pike himself realized. The medals and medallions symbolized a paternalistic trust and friendship between a chief and the ruler of a western power. It represented the acknowledgement that the so-called father would take care of his children by providing them with goods and food to make sure they wouldn't starve and freeze in the winter if crops failed and the hunt was poor. 
Pike repeatedly urged the Indian Department in St. Louis to take note, to no avail. Growing pains in the young nation meant that Indian agents were stretched too thin and had too little to give. Men like Agent Nicholas Bolvin and Prairie du Chien often gave out of his own stores and hoped to keep a half dozen disgruntled tribes at peace. Most of the tribes in the Northwest Territory and the Upper Mississippi looked to Britain for supplies of food, blankets, guns, and ammunition. Black Hawk was only more aggravated when the Americans built Fort Madison on the Des Moines River. Black Hawk stated, several people immediately went down to see what was going on, myself among them. On our arrival we found that they were building a fort. The soldiers were busily engaged in cutting timber, and I observed that they took their arms with them when they went into the woods. The whole party acted as if they would do it in an enemy's territory. The chiefs held a council with the officers or headmen of the party, which I did not attend when understood from them that the war chief had said that they were building homes for a trader who was coming there to live and would sell us goods very cheap, and that the soldiers were to remain to keep him company. We were pleased at this information and hoped that it was all true, but we were not so credulous as to believe all these buildings were intended merely for the accommodation of a trader. Being distrustful of their intentions, we were anxious for them to leave off building and go back down the river. Almost from the beginning, Sac and other tribes tried to take the fort. U.S. troops were harassed when they left the fort, and in April 1809 only the threat of cannon fire stopped an attempting storming of Fort Madison. Elsewhere, Harrison confronted the Indian leader Tecumseh, who under the influence of his brother called the Prophet, sent messengers hundreds of miles to call all Native Americans together to resist American expansion. Black Hawk remembered it well. The Prophet explained to us the bad treatment the different nations of Indians had received from the Americans, by giving them a few presents and taking their land from them. I remember well his saying, If you don't join your friends on the Wabash, the Americans will take this very village from you. I little thought then that his words would come true. Supposing he was using these arguments merely to encourage us to join him, we agreed that we would not. Word from the neighboring Winnebago tribe told how several of their warriors were killed in battle between Tecumseh's Confederacy and the United States. This encouraged Black Hawk to attack Fort Madison again. The drum beat. I examined the priming of my gun and eagerly watched the gate to open. Four men came out and went down to the river after wood. While they were gone, another man came out and walked towards the river, was fired upon and killed by a Winnebago. The others immediately ran for the fort, and two of them were killed. We then took shelter under the bank, out of reach of fire from the fort. The firing commenced from both parties and continued all day. The next day I took my rifle and shot in two the cord by which they hoisted their flag, and prevented them from raising it again. Black Hawk and his men were unable to take the fort before they ran out of ammunition. For Black Hawk, this battle was part of a conflict between his people and native allies and the United States. Little did he know that the United States and Great Britain were already fighting the War of 1812. Now Black Hawk and the Indian nations of the Northwest wouldn't be fighting alone. They would work cohesively and rack up a long list of early successes. With British help, the Indians quickly seized Fort Mackinac, Fort Dearborn, and present-day Chicago and Detroit. Soon the British, their French-Canadian supporters, and native allies had control of Green Bay, the Fox, Wisconsin Waterway, and Prairie du Chien, the prime gathering area for Sioux, Winnebago, Menominee, Potawatomi, Sac, Fox, Iowa, Kickapoo, and other tribes. Whoever controlled Prairie du Chien had the best chance of influencing these tribes and the surrounding area through gifts and so-called talks given by persuasive Indian agents. A British trader had landed at Rock Island with two boats loaded with goods and requested us to come up immediately, because he had good news for us and a variety of presents. The news ran through the camp like a fire in the prairie. Here ended all hopes of our remaining at peace, having been forced into war by being deceived by American promises. We yelled, fired our guns, and commenced beating our drums, and a British flag was hoisted. Black Hawk received a silk flag and one of the highly prized medals to wear around his neck. Black Hawk, already favoring the British side, was convinced to align himself with them openly. 
his group of fox and sock warriors received the name the British Band. The Americans realized that they were losing control of the Northwest Territory, and in June 1814 they sent an expedition up the Mississippi and built Fort Shelby at Prairie du Chien. Their presence was short-lived. British forces and native allies attacked and captured the fort the next month, renaming it Fort McKay in honor of the British commander. In response, Americans attempted to first relieve the siege and then recapture the fort. Several ships under the command of Zachary Taylor came under attack by Black Hawk. I had a full view of the boats, all sailing with a strong wind. I discovered that one boat was driven ashore. We approached it cautiously and fired upon the men on the shore. We advanced to the river's bank under cover and commenced firing at the boat. Our balls passed through the plank and did execution as I could hear them screaming in the boat. I prepared my bows and arrows to throw fire to the sail and succeeding in setting the sail on fire. The other boats returned to help their companions and managed to safely evacuate them, leaving the boat in Black Hawk's hands. Hearing a Black Hawk's success, McKay sent down a cannon with gunners from Prairie du Chien to assist the Sac and Fox in controlling the Mississippi waterway. The war in the West was going well for the British and the Native Americans. Plans were formed to launch an attack on St. Louis the next spring. If the British would have been victorious at New Orleans instead of suffering a major defeat at the hands of Andrew Jackson, the British and Indians would have had control of the entire Mississippi River. Yet it was not to be. Even if the British had been successful, it would not have made a difference. The Treaty of Ghent was signed in December 1814. Its articles re-established the pre-war borders, status quo, antebellum. The most significant article of the treaty was Article 9, which dealt with the issue of Native American rights. The British previously had pushed for the creation of an independent Native territory as a buffer zone. But with military setbacks in 1814, they lost bargaining power. The United States established full control of their frontier. They planned to enforce it, too. Before the war, the British had traded freely with Native Americans on U.S. soil, and their Indian agents operated from bases along the border to influence and diplomatically control the Northwest. Bound by the peace treaty, the British destroyed Fort McKay before leaving. Black Hawk and the British band continued to fight the American months after news of peace reached the West. By the end of the war, the United States had learned a valuable lesson. If the nation wanted to control and influence the Indians living on their soil, they had to establish a military presence alongside Indian agencies. Starting in 1816, the military constructed a series of forts. Fort Howard in Green Bay. Fort Crawford in Prairie du Chien. A few years later, Fort Snelling in Minnesota. These forts demonstrated that the United States was willing and able to use force to support their policies. But the fort that had the biggest immediate impact on Black Hawk and the Sac and the Fox was Fort Armstrong, constructed on Rock Island, which had previously been a garden island for the Sauk village Sackanac. Technically, this land had been given up in the Treaty of St. Louis in 1804. Black Hawk had always refused to recognize it, though. Yet when Black Hawk finally signed a peace treaty in May 1816, he unwittingly confirmed his compliance with the Treaty of 1804. Lack of good communication may be to blame more so than deception. In American eyes, the Sox had rightfully sold them their land east of the Mississippi. To Black Hawk, he never agreed to give up the land, especially his beloved village of Sauconuk. We started back to our village on the Rock River. Here we found that troops had arrived to build a fort at Rock Island. This, in our opinion, was a contradiction to what we had done to prepare for war in time of peace. In the next decade, settlers began to arrive. Black Hawk was often away hunting at war or going as far as to continue to visit British agents in Canada. One time, as he returned to Sauconuk, he received information that three families of whites had arrived at his village and destroyed some of the lodges. They were making fences and dividing the cornfields for their own use. After complaining to the interpreter at Fort Armstrong, Black Hawk was encouraged to cross the Mississippi as the Sac and Fox leader Keokuk had done before. One of the biggest obstacles in peaceful resolutions between the white Americans and the Native Americans was a cultural understanding of land. 
My reason teaches me that the land cannot be sold. The Great Spirit gave it to his children to live upon and cultivate, as far as it is necessary for their subsistence. As long as they occupy and cultivate it, they have the right to the soil. Nothing can be sold, but such things as can be carried away. This wasn't just a problem for the Sauk on the Rock River. To the north, miners had been digging for lead on land traditionally held by both the Sauk and Winnebago. There was great confusion on which land had been open to settlement and development, and which was still owned by the natives. Another threat to the stability on the frontier was the near incessant warfare between the many tribes that lived in the area. The Sioux hated the Chippewa. The Sauk were mortal enemies of the Sioux. The Winnebago on the Mississippi River intermarried with the Sioux and considered them allies, while the Rock River Winnebago felt the same way about the Sauk. Indian Superintendent William Clark wanted to establish clear boundaries between the tribes to ensure that there was no more fighting over territory, which put white settlers at risk as well. In 1825, the first Treaty of Prairie du Chien was signed, establishing borders for the tribes. However, this concept wasn't always communicated clearly. The second Treaty of Prairie du Chien, concluded on July 29, 1829, was between the United States and representatives of the Council of Three Fires, also known as the United Nations of Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Indians. By this treaty, the tribes ceded to the United States an area in present-day northwestern Illinois and southwestern Wisconsin. This treaty established reservation areas in western Illinois for the band of Potawatomi nations. This treaty also preserved the rights of the Council of Three Fires to hunt in the ceded territory. The United States government attempted to act on squatters, who operated mines on unoccupied land that was not open for development. Yet these treaties failed to keep the peace. In 1827, Winnebago Chief Redbird and his men reacted to the false rumor that one of their men had been killed at Fort Snelling. They went on a murdering rampage, firing on boats on the Mississippi and killing settlers. The so-called Winnebago War was short and limited, yet it kept the frontier tensions high. The military established another fort, here seen as drawn by Jefferson Davis at the portage of the Fox and Wisconsin rivers in the middle of Winnebago territory. Farther south, Black Hawk continued to resist removal. Although most of his nation followed the leadership of Keokuk, Black Hawk remained obstinate. We are a divided people, forming two parties, Keokuk being at the head of one, willing to barter rights merely for the good opinion of the whites, and cowardly enough to desert our village to them. I was at the head of the other party, and was determined to hold on to my village, although I had been ordered to leave it. In 1831, the Indian agent, interpreter, and traders who considered Black Hawk a friend all encouraged him to peacefully remove himself and his band across the river. Pleas turned into threats when General Edmund P. Gaines arrived with large numbers of soldiers. They were prepared to use force. Black Hawk responded in anger and frustration. We never sold our country. We never received any annuities from our American father. And we are determined to hold on to our village. Gaines replied, Who is Black Hawk? He replied, I am Sack. My forefather was a Sack, and all nations call me Sack. Gaines replied, My business is to remove you peaceably if I can, but forcibly if I must. I will give you two days to cross the Mississippi. Then I will force you away. Like Tecumseh, Black Hawk had a prophet of his own, White Cloud. Through a dream, the prophet was told to send a daughter of a chief to the fort to make one last plea. The woman was offered a place to stay, but the rest of the sack must go. Black Hawk saw that he had no option but to leave in peace. Yet there would not be peace for long. The intertribal warfare had not been ended by the Treaty of Prairie du Chien. In August 1831, members of the Fox tribe traveled up to Prairie du Chien to avenge the deaths of their relatives at the hands of the Sioux and Menominee. Considered a normal and legal practice among native peoples, the slaughter and scalping of 28 women and children within the site of Fort Crawford was murder to U.S. officials. Around the same time, Neopope returned from British Canada with words of encouragement. He had left to seek advice on what to do about the land the Sac had felt had been wrongfully taken from them. Neopope reported that the British would support Black Hawk if it came to war. Black Hawk conferred with the Prophet, who then told Black Hawk that the British would send guns, ammunition, and supplies to them at Milwaukee. 
White Cloud also claimed that the Ottawa, Chippewa, Potawatomis, and Winnebago were all ready to join Black Hawk and revolt against the Americans. Seeing as Black Hawk had only success with the British aid less than 20 years ago in the War of 1812, it seemed to him that he would succeed where Tecumseh had failed. He would unite the native tribes and drive out the Americans. On April 6, 1832, Black Hawk and his British band crossed the Mississippi into the state of Illinois. Refusing General Atkinson's right to demand his return, Black Hawk continued his march up the Rock River toward conflict with the Americans. Alright, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to our channel, the Black Hawk Channel. Get ready for a lot more videos covering this war.